Good morning, Igor. Good morning, Kate. Again, we've spoken to each other a few times recently. It's nice to see you again. <laughs> Looking dapper as ever. Yeah. And uh, so this morning, everybody will be talking about uh, Bamfi's estates and winemaking in Piedmont. Um, and so I'm going to start screen sharing shortly. But as ever, you are all muted, um, apart from myself and Eagle. And so we would ask you to um, put your questions into the chat function. Um, and Eagle, we're just going to run through a, um, a little presentation PowerPoint. So I'm going to hopefully this isn't going to be on be beyond my technical ken. Um, so Eagle, um, let's go to PowerPoint. Here we are. There we go. So we've got a lovely view of Piedmont there. Um, yeah. so give us some, some background, Igor, um, as to Bamfi and their, their vineyard holdings in Piedmont, if you will. Yes, so as you well know, Bamfi established in Tuscany, in Montalcino, in 78. So the Mariani family bought a huge land uh, at that time, coming back from the United States, importing the wine that we're producing in the US. And then after just one year, 1979, they bought an existing winery in Stratini, in the province of Alessandria, very close to Asti area, in the eastern part of Piedmont, that uh, became our twin estate, the Banfi Piemonte. So uh, the Bruzzone family was the name of the winery they, they bought, they purchased, was one of the oldest uh, sparkling wine producer in Italy and was finally one year before the Italian reunification, 1860. Uh, you just need to imagine that 10 years before, in 1850, the first, uh, uh, let's say, Metodo Classico, uh, Champenoise wine, was produced in Piemonte by Gancia. So we were in those time of the history where the sparkling wine were born in that part of the area. So these are some pictures of the uh, winery you know, in Strevi, is the name of the little village funded by Bruzzone. And this is what we purchased in 18, 1979. So it's 41 years old, it's a young history for a winery in Piemonte, but very old because uh, as I said, Bruzzone was from the previous century. So um, why did Banffy buy there? They obviously bought this quite soon after they bought the estates in Tuscany. Yeah. So what, what um, prompted them to buy um, in Piedmont? Yeah, uh, you know that the Mariani uh, started the business in New York in 1919, so about 101 years ago. So the the, the aim was to get uh, a winery in the two most important wine regions in Italy, so Tuscany and Piedmont. So uh, and the Piedmontese wines were a complement to the Tuscan wine portfolio. So we are very famous, of course, for Brunello di Montalcino, as we are the leader of the appellation. But the Bruzzone family in uh, Piedmont were producing mainly sparkling that were to complement the uh, Banffi portfolio, additioning some uh, sparkling and uh, light alcohol wines uh, that were those high demanded in the US at that time. So the Mariani started to, let's say they made Lambrusco very famous and popular in the United States. And as you know, Lambrusco can be both dry and sweet and is uh, sparkling and red. So the demand for this kind of wines in the US was very, very high. And so the wines from Piedmont were, let's say, uh, adding a plus, a very important sales point to the Banffi portfolio in Tuscany. So we're not talking here about um, Nebbiolo-based um, wines, which is what I think a lot of people would associate with Piedmonte. We're looking at things like Moscato and um, Brachetto d'Aki, the, 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 those traditional styles of the, of the region. Yeah. yeah, indeed, we are one hour driving from Barolo village, so not far away from the most uh, iconic appellation in Piedmont. So, Barolo, Barbaresco, and the Lange in general. But we are in the eastern part of the region that is the, the, the largest, the world, the largest aromatic uh, wine district in the world because it, this is the, the heart of production of Asti. And Asti is Moscato Bianco, white Moscat, and Barchetto, that is a native grape variety coming only from this area. 
and also other aromatic grape varieties like uh, Malvasia. There are two black Malvasia produced in this area. So we can definitely say that this is the best region in, in the world to produce aromatic grape varieties. And Asti has been for years and years the leader of export wines, Italian uh, exporting wines all over the world, just before the big boom of Prosecco. But Asti was, uh, let's say, the, the money maker from the Italian wine business for, for so long in the past. So Asti and Brachetto, they made more or less in the same way as uh, Prosecco is made. We call it the uh, Sharma method. So it's a second fermentation winemaking made in big vats, uh, autoclaves, that uh, let's say uh, are following the same rules and process and method and philosophy of the Champenoise method, but in ba much bigger vats. So, but what is really uh, sometimes important to understand that both Asti and Barchetto are absolutely easy drinking wine. So uh, you, you say correctly, a kind of a guilty pleasure of wines. <laughs> They are so difficult to make. So the wine making for these two wines can be really complicated just to, uh, to, 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 to be deeper in explanations. Uh, Asti is the final result of an aromatic grape because Moscato Bianco is aromatic and Barchetto as well. And so by definition, the aromatic grape varieties has primary aromas mainly. So whatever you produce with those grapes will smell and taste more or less the same. So if you go and pick uh, kind of a, a, a little bunch of Moscato Bianco in the fields and you taste, it will taste very close to the wine, to not say the same. And the same is for Barchetto and Malvasia and so on. So what is difficult in the winemaking is to preserve these kind of primary aromas. And to do that is a very complex technology, I mean, a complex process. As I used to say, and this is following the philosophy of Banfi uh, production, everything is made in the vineyard. So what is really, uh, what it really counts is the quality of the grapes to ferment and to become wines. So everything starts in the beautiful pictures you have seen, you can see now. So if the grapes are high quality and that means a very high acidity, good terpenic aromas in due to the weather condition and the Travis existence, then in the end we will have a fantastic wine that can be re-ferment in autoclaves very, very, uh, in a, as I say, complicated way. So the most of uh, Asti is just uh, decanted for one night after a gentle press and the stemming at low temperature, let's say six, eight degrees. In those uh, 24 hours, more or less, the most is limpid and is zero degrees, zero alcohol percent, sorry. So a kind of fruit juice, beautiful, very sweet and very rich in aromas. Then it's put into autoclaves and is fermented 16 degrees for about seven, eight days. So very complicated. In these seven, eight uh, days, the fermentation is very low and gentle and the temperature is low, of course, to preserve aromas and the, timing, six, one week more or less, is enough to get the 7% alcohol which is required by the EOCG appellation of Asti. Then when it's 7% alcohol, we stop fermentation by just lowering the temperature. So the temperature is going down to zero, one degree, so the yeasts cannot uh, transform anymore the sugars into alcohol. And then the Asti is almost gone. It's almost done, sorry. So when the fermentation is stopped, we need, and this is the real complex technology needed to produce Asti, is a filter and then bottled isobaric. That means that in the big autoclave when the fermentation took place, the vat was closed and the bubbles were inside the wines and the pressure was about five atmosphere. So you will know that to bottle a wine from a vat which has five atmosphere, you need another vat with the same pressure. Otherwise, the liquid, the liquid cannot go into uh, the other parts, let's say, <laughs> just to be simple. So, Possibly go wrong. Go, yeah, it's, it's very complicated yeah, to, to, to explain, of course. But once you have the same pressure in both uh, recipients, 
then the wine can be bottled quite gently and, and simply. And the, usually the big results in this kind of winemaking is to preserve aromas, of course, which are uh, the, the best characteristics of this kind of wines, which are so gentle, lovely to drink. Uh, they smell like musk, musk mm. that's why the name. And they are sweet, of course, so to keep the balance between acidity, bubbles, and sugar level is, of course, very complicated. And usually the final result is a wine which is 110, 120 uh, grams per liter residual sugar. So it's a very sweet wine, but that uh, tastes much more fresh and delicate because the high acidity that usually is 6.2, 6.3 grams per liter. So very high acidity, very high sugar level, and very low alcohol. So this is Asti. And if you go, Forte with uh, Rosergale Bracchetto. Here is even more complex because there's one more characteristics to take into consideration when uh, producing Bracchetto and is the color. So not only bubbles, not only sugar level, not only low alcohol, but also red color. So the differences into the two winemaking uh, processes from Asti and Bracchetto is just the red uh, vinification in skin contact. So in those seven, eight days of uh, fermentation, the, uh, the, the, the skins are in contact, the most giving a kind of a nice uh, red rosé color. And in the end, a little bit of tannins will be into the wines, which are very useful for the final, uh, let's say, uh, clarification, which is they are naturally attracting the proteins, so the wines is clarified automatically and we don't even need to clarify it. So it's an even more complicated wine making, but giving the same guilty pleasures <laughs> final result. <laughs> it's amazing, these, these wines um, kind of are so easy to drink and they're always the ones that when you show them at tastings, um, yeah. kind of people are a little bit sniffy to start with and then yeah. when they actually get it, you know, get the uh, get some wine in glass they absolutely love them and um, so what you're explaining here is they're incredibly difficult to make but incredibly easy to drink yeah you, you experimented with me many times that if you just have a bottle uh, uh, and for wine tasting uh, uh, a walk around tasting and nobody's tasting so probably by the label it's uh, a little weird oh come on it's sparkling it's red it's sweet it's low alcohol then as soon as the first will try the wines all of the rest of the audience will come and usually the bottle's finishing for the first. So that's a big fry for us. But what is very important, just to once again give a little background to Bracchetto and Rosa Regala in general, is that this is our best seller in the United States. We are number one producer of Bracchetto in the Asti region that you can see on the map here. So, so Banfi was once again uh, following his philosophy of research and study, and we revitalized a great variety that was almost to die, or at least to disappear, because in the 70s and 80s was not that popular as it is today. Then, of course, the Bracchetto knew a, a big boom all over the world because of his easy and natural way of drinking, but the 50% of the sales of Bracchetto d'Aqui that we are still producing today is going to the United States. So it was a smart decision for the Mariani family and Banfi to keep on producing these lovely wines and to export the wine in the United States. It's weird because I, I read some uh, statistics and story in, and in the first years of Banfi, uh, Bracchetto was out of stock before Brunello di Montalcino. It is Incredible if you think it today, of course, you're talking about two planets, but the demands, especially uh, on the other side of the ocean for these kind of ones was even higher than you can imagine. So it's a real pride to be number one producer of this one. So aside from, from the, tr these, tradi these two traditional um, wines of the region, you've also continued to develop sparkling wines um, that perhaps are a bit more modern in style. And if we move on, perhaps you'd oh, like yeah. to talk a little bit about some of the, um, the other wines that you've been making um, in the area. Yeah, the, one of the last uh, or the most recent DOCG of Piedmont is uh, Alta Langa, 
and Alta means the high hills, let's say, and Langa is the, the land, the area of production of many uh, wines in Piedmont. So the Alta Langa is only for sparkling wine and is a DOCG itself that was born in 2010 by introducing, let's say, new rules in Piedmont about the Champenoise method production. So it's uh, 146 municipalities in three different provinces. So it's a huge area, apparently, but it's not that huge as you can see in the map because it's only mandatory 250 meters above the sea level to produce Pinot Noir and Chardonnay for Alta Langa. So the reason for uh, the birth of this DOCG appellation is because the quality and the land and the terroir for Piedmont is much more vocated for Champenoise wines than many other places in, in Italy. So uh, you probably heard about the Francia Corta or Trentino, Trento DOC, but I should say that the birth of sparkling wines in, in Italy was in Piemonte in 1850, as I said. And so they never, uh, they say, exploited completely the possibilities and the opportunities of producing sparkling wines. And from 2010, luckily, very few producers uh, began a new era for Champenoise wines in Piemonte, as Manfi was one of these, taking, taking the challenge. So we are doing Alta Langa, the OCG, that by the law must be vintage only. So it's the only appellation in the world that must uh, state the vintage on the label. So here is 14 and 15, but now the, the, the last two in commerce is 2016. I don't know if you can see. And they are the, the result, the white one of a blend of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, and the rosé one on the right and side is Pinot Noir pure, extra blue. So this kind of very peculiar and precise winemaking, 250 meters at least, minimum 36 years on lease for, uh, let's say, giving complexity and a lot of aromas to the wines and vintage, compulsory to state on the label, makes Altalanga only premium wines. So uh, we uh, try to differentiate the production of, of course, Charmat or Martinotti uh, wines with Champenoise wines. And Barchetto and Asti where he's drinking very simple, low alcohol. This can be really compared with Champagne. So these are wines that definitely will get into the premium category of sparkling wines all around the world. So these are traditional method, bottle fermented, um, and you said, I think there was a, a slight um, a mix up because you said 36 years on Lees. I think it's 36 months. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, 36 years is a little too much. Yes. A little bit too long. Um, okay. Yeah. And, and altitude at, um, at 250 meters or above? Yeah, or above, minimum. So that means uh, high acidity in order to preserve once again aromas and the second fermentation must be definitely uh, easy to do. And, you know, also in Champagne and all of the sparkling wine regions in the world, that uh, acidity is what is really making the difference. So uh, producing a Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in high uh, altitude with uh, wonderful aromas and, of course, not that high yields in the... In the in vineyards is definitely a premium uh, result in the end. So the, the, these two wines, in a blind taste, they are not far away from Champagne. The extra brut is giving more dry texture. They are very, let's say, nutty, uh, very creamy as well. The foam is amazing. They are definitely quite complex in the aromas. They're citrusy, almondy. Uh, so this kind of complexity that you expect from a premium Champenoise style. And you also sort of pushed on a little bit more with this style, with the, um, with the Cuvée Aurore, yeah. is that right? This is the, a preview because we just launched a few weeks ago and it's the first time we do it is a hundred months, not a hundred years, <laughs> Cuvée Aurora. So it's uh, the same concept, 85% Pinot Noir and 15 Chardonnay, Alta Langa DOCG. It's a reserva 2010. That has been, uh, say, aged on lease for 100 months. So giving even more complexity, uh, a different kind of style of aroma, very beautiful color. I, I just looking forward to taste it because I didn't do that yet. So I, I have a bottle in my 
sell our comic in the next days and I will be happy to celebrate the new Italian lockdown with a magnum bottle of Altalanga 100 months. So, um, it, this has only been produced in magnum? Yeah, only magnums and only by allocation, of course. So this would be the new, uh, say, uh, even extra premium wine that we do. So it's Padusé, so bone dry, very, very, uh, say, champenois style. And this is the, I think, direction that we are going to take in the Atalanta production, going into very, very dry wines, just, uh, let's say, trying to express the most from the two great varieties from the terroir they are coming from. So this is a real niche of our production. Now, I believe Liz has a question. Um, I yeah. am unable, actually, to see the chat at this point. Um, so I don't know if you can. Um, to At see the bottling. Sorry? Yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. You've unmuted me. I, I was just, uh, this is, sorry, this was going back to the Asti. I didn't follow, fully follow how it got out of the tank into the bottle. Um, but if you'd like to deal with that later, this is much more interesting. <laughs> no, about about I, can, I can just uh, explain it very easily now. So in the big autoclaves, uh, close the, the pressure inside is about five bars so the bottle cannot uh, let's say uh, you, you cannot move the wash in the into the bottle if the bottle has a different pressure so you wow. must create the same pressure into the bottle and that's why it's a champenoise bottle like champagne and once the same bars are both in the autoclaves and in the bottle by nitrogen is a, an inert uh, gas you can move the two wine, the wines into the two recipients. So it's just a matter of pressure in both autoclaves and bottle. Once it's the same, then you can move the liquid. Otherwise, you cannot. So it's very uh, complicated if you consider that the wine, on the other hand, is completely uh, easy drinking and very, very simple. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand that it was the uh, the bottle was uh, under pressure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so I think if we've covered sparkling, shall we move on from sparkling onto um, onto some table wines now and have a have a quick uh, shifty around yeah. the, around the table wines? Uh, yes, of course. So we are in the Alessandria province, that is also the the, the, the kingdom of Gavi. Gavi is uh, very very popular, and it was even more popular in, in the past decades in both the United States and in the UK is uh, it's a, let's say a kind of posh Pinot Grigio. So it's uh, very mineral, very easy drinking, but with this kind of uh, uh, sapidity and tasty profile and texture that is giving the wine uh, uh, an excellent approach with the food and also an, an excellent aperitivo, uh, you know, a fantastic wine by the glass at all. So, and Gavi is made in this area, which is uh, where we are. So you can see the Panfi Piemonte in the, with the blue color is in the Gavi appellation. And we are actually uh, a very famous producer of Gavi. So Gavi, uh, just to give you an idea of how popular it was in, in the 80s and 90s, was allocated. So we were used to allocate Gavi in, in only 30 years ago. Now we allocate uh, Alta Langa, 100 months, or Brunello di Montecito Riserva, but in the past, these were the wines that was uh, leading the, the, the sales, the exports of white wines abroad, so from, from Italy. So that means that this is definitely another one more clever reason, uh, reason to both the estate in Strelli and in uh, Piedmont to produce a very popular wines like this. So mineral is drinking, is a wine, honestly, I love because it's easy to approach and matching any kind of food is so simple once again but with uh, a very strong personality is aging also very well so it's a wine that is surprisingly uh, Best more complex and developing uh, better than you expect so definitely uh, another fantastic premium white wine produced there i've never had a, an, an, an aged garvey that would be quite interesting um, and and Garvey to Garvey is the same as Garvey, is that right? Garvey yeah, variety and the name of the village. Yeah, it's just the name of the village, or it's 
Gavi to Gavi meant to be the Gavi from the Gavi village, and that's it. But by the law, by the appellation, the OCGs, there's no difference between a Gavi and a Gavi de Gavi. So they follow the same rules of production. Gavi de Gavi is just to mean that that product is made, made in the Gavi village. So Gavi is the name of the village. You can call Gavi the wine as well. The grape is Cortese. So it's the third grape variety you hear today that is native from Piedmont. So Cato Bianco, white Muscat only. Bracchetto d'Aqui and Cortese. So these are grape varieties you can find only here. Of course, Moscato Bianco is more spread all around the world, but the other two are definitely native and autochtone from Piedmont and the eastern part of the, of the region. And so then to, to talk um, about reds, but we're still not talking about Nebbiolo. Um, yeah. We're talking, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna talk um, about La Luce finally, yeah. um, which yeah. is the red wine from the area. So um, this is a very unusual grape variety. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, La Luz means uh, the light, La Lucha, uh, the dialect of the region. And it's definitely since we start to collaborate with the Villa Tour Agency in the UK, maybe the, the real uh, surprise uh, of their portfolio, because it's a wine that is uh, giving more than the expectations. So La Luz is uh, made by Alba Rossa, 100%. So one more a native grape variety from Piemonte. And Alba Rossa uh, was made by a genetic cross uh, in 1938, if I will remember, by a, a winemaker in Piedmont with the aim to cross together the two most important grape varieties of Piedmont. So Nebbiolo and Barbera. It was Nebbiolo di Dronero, so it's a very complex name, but actually the real grape variety was Chateau's, not far away from Nebbiolo, but anyway, in the same, let's say, characteristics and style. And as I said, uh, this winemaker, uh, Dalmaso, was trying to uh, make a super grape variety by blending the uh, high uh, productive qualities of Barbera, the inky color, uh, high acidity, with the noble characteristics of Nebbiolo. So aging potential, tannins, uh, complexity. But in the end, a new uh, song was born. Nothing to do with the parents, of course, just a few uh, small characteristics, but in the end, Albarossa is a grape itself. So it's not a blend, as I said, but it's a cross. So it's like uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is coming from Sauvignon Blanc and Cabernet Franc, creating a new independent grape variety. The Luce is the same. Sorry, Albarossa is the same. So it's a grape variety, uh, very surprising because it's very deep color, I would say, uh, purple color, even after 10 years aging. And we did a vertical testing in London when Fair just last year, mm. seems like a century ago. And then it's uh, very soft with very uh, gentle and round tannins with a fantastic mouthfeel and long and persistent finish, which is giving the wine a very modern approach. But with all of those kind of complexity and let's say uh, wide range of aromas that you expect from a noble wine from Piedmont. So it's not Barbera, apart maybe from the color, is not Nebbiolo, is Albarossa. So we did the first vintage in 2006 because the, the story of this grape is that the Piedmont region gave the possibility to some producers to take the challenge and to revitalize Albarossa that was abandoned, of course, in the past because it was commercially not that successful. And Buffy was one of the first taking the challenge and producing Albarossa and the first vintage 2006. Uh, so it's now the 17 in commerce, so it's only 11 vintages we are producing now. And all of those were absolutely stunning. Beautiful colors, uh, fantastic, as I say, mouthfeel, very round, a uh, little spiciness. And this was how they were showing in the beginning. But after 10, 11 years, the 2006 tasted just now is absolutely the same. So this is even more surprising from a uh, niche of production like this. Uh, in the beginning, uh, only 10,000 bottles. Now we are trying to double the, pr the production because it's really also commercially speaking, very successful. And so this is a, a new era for a uh, red gray variety in that area. So we cannot compare Albarossa with Nebbiolo, but definitely not even Nebbiolo can be compared with Albarossa. So we are now uh, one of the five fathers of this absolutely fantastic grape variety and 
one of the most interesting red wines produced in that area. So it's a wine looking modern, uh, but tasting definitely from Piedmont, very complex, absolutely to try. So everybody that you experimented together with me and all of the Willa Tour uh, friends, uh, they, everybody that experimented at uh, La Luz were absolutely surprised by the quality of this wine and also <laughs> commercially speaking by the price. So it's a real premium wine that is covering a, a mid range price and, and so absolutely a must try wine definitely. So it's our pride honestly. We, we showed this um, a couple of years ago at a, um, an advanced Christmas dinner um, wine matching um, and it was the surprise star of the dinner um, to go with things like, you know, the traditional turkey with the cranberry sauce and so on. It, it really handled it brilliantly. And, you know, we've, we've done all sorts of other posh wines to go with it. Um, but this one won hands down. It was, um, it was outstanding, I have to say. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you a little, little story, but I, I teach in the Italian Sommelier Association and when I, I do the, the lesson of Piedmont and, and Valle d'Aosta, usually my two favorite regions, uh, I used to make blind tasting with Albarossa as well and nobody, nobody, believe me, can say that's Albarossa. First of all, because nobody knows it. It's very uh, niche, it's brand new, it's only 10 years old, it's uh, to explore. But once they try, it's usually their favorite. So it's the, the, the bottle usually finishing for the first, easy going, but at the same time with a very complex profile and a very noble character, characteristic. So definitely uh, a real pearl in Banff portfolio, Banff Piemonte portfolio. I think one of the things that's coming through from the wines you're talking about today is this really kind of easy drinking, easy going style yeah. to a lot of the wines coming from Piedmont. It's not something yeah. I normally associate with Piedmont because I've had some bad experiences with Nebbiolo <laughs> in my time. Um, and so it's, um, it's quite interesting to hear about the kind of easier, easier approachable styles. Yeah, I know that you're not a fan of Nebbiolo, uh, but you know, Definitely Albarossa is completely different. So once you try, you will fall in love with it. So you get the feeling of tasting a very powerful wine, very noble wine, so complex, but at the same time, as you correctly say, easy drinking. So I uh, would recommend as a lockdown wine to drink. I think we need to get our orders in. Unfortunately, for the <laughs> Let's get sorted for Christmas in advance. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that's been really fascinating. Um, I've, got, I've got a couple of questions and I don't know yeah. if um, anybody else has some questions. If they do, um, just to, to throw them into chat, as I'd said before. Um, but one of my things was, um, just so I can visualise it in my mind, how far is it from Tuscany to Piedmont? How long would it take me to drive? Oh, that's a good question. We are about four hours driving. Uh, north of Tuscany. So in the west side of Italy, if you go along the coast, let's say, it's about four hours from Banfi, Toscana to Banfi, Piemont, from Montalcino to Strelli. So it's not only a question of uh, regions or terroirs or soils, but also weather. So now with a kind of little uh, higher temperature, average temperature, uh, also Piedmont is not that cold as it was in the past but in, in just a few decades ago Piedmontese weather conditions were completely different than Tuscany so continental weather very long winters with a lot of snow uh, very short summer but hot at the same time so completely different from mild Tuscany with hot conditions almost uh, along the whole year and, and different kind of uh, also great varieties because of that so yes it's uh, definitely north four hours north from Tuscan. So not, not good areas for, San, for the traditional um, Tuscan varieties, you know, the San Giovese no. doesn't do, do no, well. No, no, no. San Giovese is not uh, allowed to be produced, but it, it couldn't be produced up there, as well as Nebbiolo cannot be produced in, uh, in uh, Tuscany. We have some example in Montalcino of Moscat family, but it's not the white one, it's the, the orange Moscat or say the Alessandria Moscat, and indeed, Banfi is doing Florus, is a Moscadello in Montalcino, but the white Moscat also is not, uh, let's say, performing well in Tuscany, it's too cold. Mm. While Piemonte definitely takes that kind of very fresh, refreshing and aromatic styles that is what it is famous for. 
yeah. So presumably, um, it seems logical, but um, just to confirm, you've got two different winemaking teams at Banff. You've got yeah. one working at the Piedmont Winery and one working in Tuscany. Um, yeah, that's, they, that's in, they collaborate, yeah, but they don't meet. Yeah, definitely uh, very, very important. We have two facilities, so we cannot do any uh, Piedmontese wines in Tuscany and vice versa. So all of the wines coming from uh, Banff, Piedmont are uh, made in Piemonte, so in our winery up there in Strevi, and the winemaking teams are different. They change ideas. We luckily, as as uh, you will know, we are famous for uh, study, research, and sustainability. So whatever we can do in Piedmonte that we already done in Tuscany is of course very welcome. So they share ideas, and uh, I, I'm quite sure that the, now the Piedmontese winemakers are very good in reds and as well as the uh, Tuscan winemakers are so good in whites as well. So this kind of, uh, let's say, uh, contamination among uh, cross, regions. Let's call it cross-fertilization. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we maybe and, don't want to talk about contamination in, a, in the time of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and something I'm so proud to say is that uh, all of the ones that Banffy produce, and this is uh, very, let's say, uh, it, it comes automatically in Piedmont, uh, are vegan friendly so this is very important because the, even though we are not uh, vegan we are not uh, organic uh, certified but we are sustainable all of the uh, uh, filtering or let's say uh, substances we use in both Tuscany and Piedmont are uh, not uh, animal coming from animals so all of the ones we produce in both regions are, are definitely vegan friendly this is quite important before for clarification of uh, Asti and Barchetto. Barchetto doesn't need to, but for Asti, it's not made by uh, egg or any kind of other animal substance. So this is also very, very important. Now, I think, um, Sophie, I think you have a question and I can see Guy sticking his hand up as well. So Rebecca, can you unmute Sophie? Hello. Yes, I hi, said great. Hi, um, hi Igor. Um, I was wondering about the wines, um, I know a lot about the UK market and how they're kind of received here, but in Italy and also regionally in Piedmont, how, which wines are the most popular in Piedmont and in Italy for the Banffi Piedmont wines and, um, and why? What, what, what kind of do people locally think of them? So uh, that's a very because the, how the, the, the locals, the domestic market is, uh, let's say, uh, perceiving the wines from Piedmont is um, sometimes different from the other countries. But definitely we are very famous for Rosa Regale, so the Parchetto, it is our best seller also in Italy from the Banfi Piemonte wines. Here it is. Of course, you cannot miss to have a bottle at home in your cellar because it's a wonderful wine also for, not only for uh, domestic use or for home consumption, but also for the restaurants as a nice uh, end of a meal because it's easy going, it's sparkling, it's all alcohol, so very well appreciated. But then also the, the bubbles we are doing up there is also uh, a very good important sales point for us. So both the Alta Langa, Rosé and the White are definitely booming now in Italy. You need to uh, maybe understand that the price for Alta Langa in Italy is uh, let's say at least one third or one uh, half lower than a champagne price. So these kind of popular native uh, wines uh, coming from Piedmont are definitely easier to approach and more affordable in terms of pricing than champagne. And then of course Asti. Asti is also going very well in both on-trade and off-trade. Uh, and Gavi, but I would say that the most popular is definitely uh, Rosa Regale. Now we have a, a big demand for the 100 months uh, Alta Langa because it's uh, really niche and there are many regions, especially in the north, but also in, in the central part of Italy, drinking a lot of bubbles. So uh, Italian bubbles are very, very popular. We do also another Champenoise wine in Banfi Piemonte called Banfi Brut. It's just a simple blend of Chardonnay. Pinot Noir uh, and Pinot Bianco that is also very popular and is one of our best seller once again in, in Italy. So uh, Rosa Regale definitely is in common between Italian markets and all of the rest of the world. 
Thank you, everybody. And um, I think we're getting on now to wrapping things up, Igor. That was really lovely. Um, it's getting towards your lunchtime, or at least um, English lunchtime, maybe not Italian lunchtime. <laughs> Um, so thanks everyone, um, lovely to see you all again on here and thank you to Igor who once again has provided us with lots of information and lots of food for thought.